So we will move on to our school reopening workshop. And I'll turn that over to Dr. Brock. All right, thank you. Um, we've got a few folks that have joined us to participate in providing some updates. So uh, part of the workshop, I, I guess I would characterize as just uh, some updates on either things that have happened or just, uh, just to kind of build your understanding of how we're, we're progressing through the school year. And then certainly the last half is just a, a little bit of, um, you know, things that would love to hear some feedback on in regards to as we, you know, look forward to uh, what are the opportunities we might have going forward. So that's really how I'll characterize this. We've kind of got four sections. So we will pause at the end of each section. And then that way, if you have questions that, uh, you know, pertain to some of those slides that we went through, we'll go ahead and try to take those in a somewhat timely fashion so that we don't have to hold all of our discussion or questions for the end. And so I'll go ahead and just real quickly share my screen and then um, Erica will, will take over here pretty quickly with, with going over some surveys. So, And I just remind people that workshops for the board are an opportunity for us to learn, listen, ask questions. And so it's just time that we set aside. It's not for making any decisions necessarily. It's just really an opportunity for us to spend some time reviewing pertinent issues to the district. All right, so just to kind of reiterate what some of the, the key themes were as we went through school reopening, um, we want to continue to keep these things in mind, health and safety, equity and learning. Those were kind of two of our, our big guiding principles. You know, what we're doing tonight, trying to, to consistently have good communication um, and, and throughout, throughout the school year, but certainly as we get the school year off the ground. And then we did outline adaptability and readiness. So we know that there's a lot of things we're going to navigate this school year. So keeping those things in mind as well. And then this is kind of a, a brief outline of, of the different sections that we're going to cover. Erica is going to walk through a little bit of the survey data, we're going to pause for some questions. We're going to revisit the learning options and, and what was some of the interest in those learning options. And then our principals are going to talk just a little bit about how they've tried to organize their staff to, to serve those learning options. And the next section is talking a little bit about um, uh, what I call COVID statistics or just what, what uh, are some of the things that we've been collectively trying to look at to, to guide possibly some future decision making. And then certainly at towards the end, just some things that, you know, based on a number of those items, what are some of the things that we're thinking about in terms of what could be some of our possible next steps and would once again love to get your questions and feedback on any of those sections. So that's kind of what our agenda looks like and with, without further ado I will turn it over to Erica to talk just a little bit about um, some, some surveying we've done over the past uh, three weeks and, and what's that told us. Great, thank you and I'm going to share my screen uh, just as we walk through data. You know, as, as Dr. Brock mentioned, we have been getting the voice of our stakeholders uh, throughout this whole process, uh, but certainly since the beginning of school, um, we have surveyed our families or reached out to them as well as our students and our staff. So in weeks one and two, we surveyed all families, all staff and students in grades three and 12. And last week in week three, we did a thought exchange for all families, all staff and students in grades six to 12, all of those separately so we could see what that looked like. So I'm going to walk through uh, many slides that really just highlight what we've learned uh, in the process. So here is where we are. We're going to start with family surveys. Uh, we had 853 total responses in weeks one and two, but it's interesting to note that participation decreased by right at 75% between week one and week two. Uh, in general, uh, families who selected in-person learning are less satisfied. And that tends to increase as kids get older. None of those really surprising insights, but it, it did bear out in this survey. If we look at teacher communication, purple throughout all of these, purple is either satisfied, very satisfied, yellow is dissatisfied, very dissatisfied. Um, so teacher communication, satisfaction decreased a bit between weeks one and two, but overall, this is what we look like. Canvas, the new learning management system, satisfaction actually increased between weeks one and two with the exception of the high school. Essential learning, which is lessons and assignments, it decreased slightly over the two weeks. 
daily schedule decreased overall with the exception of GOTCH, which made a pretty big gain in week two. And the availability of assistance decreased overall, once again, with the exception of GOTCH. These are themes um, that, that came out when we asked parents what you'd like us to know regarding your students' learning and the teaching during the first two weeks. Uh, yellow is what we heard in weeks one and two. Orange is what arose in week two. So synchronous time is not just needing more, but in smaller groups and time with other students face-to-face. Um, learning in week one across the board was too easy or not enough, but in during week two, we heard a lot of learning is too hard or too much, um, specifically at Manure. And then uh, also in week two, the need for more video instruction arose at the high school. If we look at our student surveys, we had 240 responses, and this decreased by 58.3% between weeks one and two. And again, these are students in grades three through 12, although we did not ask students at GOTCH what their learning option that was selected for them. We weren't sure that they would know that. Uh, and, and oh, sorry, also to note, responses from students who selected online learning increased in week two. So it was actually a few more in-person kids during week one than week two. Teachers communication uh, satisfaction decreased a bit between the two weeks. Canvas satisfaction decreased with the exception of Rogers, where they increased. Essential learning overall decreased. The daily schedule increased overall with the exception of GOTCH, where family, their satisfaction decreased, but it increased with their students. And the availability of assistance decreased overall with the exception of Rogers. Now their themes um, are, were pretty consistent. And um, again, we're, we were hearing from students at the high school specifically that it was learning was too much and there were some assignments on weekends that were um, problematic or of a concern to our students. Our staff surveys, uh, the learning team offered a survey during week one to find out how staff were doing both professionally and personally. Uh, and the results um, that are shared here are for a district survey offered during at the end of week two four weeks one and two that looked a lot like the two surveys we just went over. So we here you can see who responded on this survey. And we put buildings back to back here so you can see very satisfied to either dissatisfied or some very dissatisfied across the bars. So building communication, overall very positive. Same for district communication. If we look at Canvas, the learning management system, there's a learning curve, uh, some more buildings than others. Essential learning or assignments. The daily schedule. Availability of assistance when needed. And themes for our staff. Uh, so overall, it's going better than expected for our staff, but uh, teachers and staff are also overwhelmed and exhausted at the same time, much like our students and families. There's a lot of similar similarities in the themes that we saw. Now, as we moved into week three, we offered a thought exchange. It's currently going on. Uh, the numbers and thoughts represented here, I updated earlier today. They're not too much different this evening. So between the three exchanges, between uh, students, in grades 6 through 12, all staff and all families. We have 600 participants, over 600 thoughts contributed, and almost 12,000 rates so far. The question we asked, what are the most important things our, our school and district need to think about as we continue to respond to COVID-19 and plan for the future? So not just COVID-19, but what else should we be doing as we think through um, anything related to learning and teaching this year. As you can see where we have heard from, we did split out by building just so that we would know who was saying what and if there were top thoughts for different buildings. We've had pretty good participation across the board overall. Top thoughts for our families right now. Um, really thanking teachers and administrators, working hard, and uh, parents really want to make sure that our teachers know that even though they feel strongly sometimes that kids should be back in school, that doesn't mean they think less of teachers, if that's the case. And we're going to talk about the two different groups we're seeing. Um, students need more opportunities to connect with teachers and with other students. 
safety and uh, is, is always top of mind. And um, really, it's, it's more about equity that, and learning that we've heard before. For our staff, there's concerns about making a shift um, in learning options too quickly, making sure that their voice is heard, and advocating for their students. For our students, safety is top of mind as well, safety and health, and a lot of stress and physical and mental health needs for our students and them advocating for themselves in that way. Um, we saw this summer that this brings out a lot of differences. Um, so it's really what we've seen throughout this pandemic. There's two distinct groups of thoughts that stand between those who think students should be in person and those believe, who believe it's not yet safe to return to school. But where, uh, by the way, this did this exchange has broken the number of thoughts, the record for the number of thoughts reported so far. So mostly it's from those, and they're not necessarily inappropriate comments or thoughts. It's just someone from the other side of thinking, thinking that that thought is inappropriate. So we have um, not, we have not deleted very many thoughts at all. We've let them stand and see where they fell. But where Group A and Group B. Uh, what they have in common and where they agree is that connections are vitally important right now and there's a concern for students who might be falling behind. Similarly for staff, now their groups might shift a little. There's still some who really think it's important we should be at home uh, learning online and there's uh, groups that think we should be in school. Um, it's flip-flopped for staff and families, how many think that, which is not surprising. Uh, but again, the commonalities are uh, what families thought as well as communication being important and technology issues that still need to be addressed. For students, there weren't a great number of differences between student groups, but um, still the two distinct thoughts between support of in-person versus online learning. Uh, word clouds are good ways to just get a quick visual. So we can, you're gonna see a lot of similarities between our families, our staff, and here's our students. We're health and safety, equity and learning, those themes are still right there at the top. So our key insights, uh, again, we're, we're a community divided and um, that we're a world divided, quite honestly. Safety and health, top priority. Interestingly enough, teacher burnout is a concern, not just for our staff, but our families have mentioned that a lot, that they're concerned for our teachers and how much they're working. Um, there's a desire for additional time with teachers across the board from staff, families, and students, and a concern about the amount of work expected for students. So that is all I have for this evening. If you have any questions. We'll go ahead and pause now to see if there's any questions or, or comments. The one thing that I'll mention while, you know, any of our board members might be thinking about anything they want to follow up with is, you know, what came through the first two weeks, and I mentioned this to the staff, um, the teacher communication and the availability of assistance, I thought was just very high. Like I, across the board, that jumped out as there just really didn't seem to be any dissatisfaction um, with those two items. And, you know, those are certainly things that we have a, a lot of control over. So we can communicate. That's something we can do. Um, Hopefully we know, we know uh, a lot of answers, some answers we don't know. So we can still communicate that. And then likewise, if someone has a question or needs assistance, we, we can do our best to try to get that taken care of. And so those are very much within our control. You know, certainly a lot of those other items like Canvas, the schedule and essential learning, you know, those, are, those are, the, are the tough ones. And even then I thought, I thought uh, the responses were very positive, but certainly those are items that um, you know, are, are certainly very difficult to navigate, but, you know, certainly it's not for lack of effort that we're, we're trying to, uh, we're, we're navigating those the best we can. And like I said, I, I, I always often think about when in the world would we start school like this and then expect results that were, are pretty, for the most part, pretty favorably. And so I, I know everyone is giving, I think giving each other a lot of, uh, you know, leniency in regards to knowing that, uh, there's just a lot of things that everybody's navigating. So at the same time, the thought exchange, I think we needed to pivot to get a little different voice in the room. So I think the survey we put out the first two weeks was good just to get that quick pulse 
And now it was necessary to kind of pivot to something a little bit different. I don't know that we were going to get uh, much more out of just continuing to do that. So I appreciate everything that's coming in through the thought exchange. I think that will definitely help inform our next our next level of actions. And so I'm, I was uh, glad that we we were able to to continue to take those thoughts and uh, you know, going forward. Yeah, Dr. Barks, we might want to mention. Uh, you and I have had a, a quick conversation and we haven't landed anywhere quite yet, but we probably won't continue to do weekly surveys, but pause maybe and see um, how it goes for a couple of weeks and then touch base again, just so we don't certainly don't want to over survey our stakeholders. We want to hear, keep hearing their voices, but in, in a way that's meaningful. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. That's why we wanted to leave this one open. So we, you know, we, we uh, opened it up last week. We're leaving it open. Um, and then, like I said, we want to do our diligence with really processing this, digging into it, getting a number of folks to, to make sure that they're looking at those comments. So, so yeah, I, I envision, you know, utilizing this to really, you know, try to try to guide some of our next actions and then probably not, not having a survey uh, to, for anybody to complete this, uh, this weekend or anything like that. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, this is that was some good information. Um, when it when it's appropriate, it might be coming up later in this presentation. For all I know, um, but the uh, looking at the two sides, there's going to be a, a shift at some point in time. Where right now we have one side that wants the kids in school, and obviously they're not, and then the other side it doesn't want the kids in school, and that's what we're doing. Um, there's going to be a, a shift that comes back. Um, going the other way and I'm hoping that in between that time we can kind of get those groups together and have some dialogue I mean there is some common decency and bridging that can happen here um, and, and some some discussion because you know neither side is completely right in in their perspective it's just that it's just the way it is and uh, and it, so there's a there's a there's a bridging that hopefully we can find a way to do, and I know that it's hard, it's really hard right now, but I hope we can take a stab at it. Yeah, I think one important step is seeing where the commonalities are. That's one great tool of thought exchange where you can see not just differences, but where you also have common ground. All right. We'll go ahead and I'll share my screen and then uh, move on just real quickly to our next section. So wanted to give just a brief update on, um, on some of the learning options. And so um, this is how our learning options broke down in regards to kind of what were people choosing in regards to each grade level, um, in person, online. This is just meant to kind of give you a little bit of context there and see what that looks like at the elementary level. And uh, then we have the, uh, I guess, the uh, every, uh, in, in our, I guess, the survey that we put out, we wanted to give people an idea of what those in-person learning options are. And we thought that we might have to do um, all three of these. Certainly we thought there could be a chance where we're all back in person. We could be in a blended or hybrid and then we could be what we're doing right now, which is distance. So that was uh, kind of viewed as our in-person option. And then likewise, we have our virtual academy. So uh, we knew that there could be some students and parents that wanted to learn online. And so we, we also made that an option as well. Um, one of the things I would like to do is uh, I'm gonna go ahead and um, go one more slide and then I'll, I'll take this down. But I wanted to kind of give our um, principals a chance to talk just briefly about how have they tried to organize their staff on just a very basic level, knowing that we did put a virtual academy option out there. So we felt like we may have students that would like to, can, to do that all school year. And we wanted to allocate our staff members to serve that need. But then certainly we also knew there would be students that wanted to, to come in person. And so we knew we were going to have to have allocate staff members to do that. So just in very general terms, I'm going to kind of ask them to give you an update on what has been that basic approach, knowing that right now all of our students are 
um, you know, online or virtual. So uh, that, that doesn't make it easy, but we really haven't had to cross the threshold of um, what in-person operation looks like. But I, I at least wanted them to kind of uh, give you some insight into how they've tried to do their best to use the staff that they have to, to kind of serve both of those needs. So we're going to start at the high school and kind of work our way down and then we'll pause after we've heard from everyone to see what questions you might have. And like I said, they're not going to go through every single uh, position or uh, that they have in the building, but just in general, how they try to arrange their classroom teachers to serve these needs. So we're going to start at the high school level. So I asked Dr. Myers just to, to give us a brief overview. Okay, thank you, Travis. Um, to start, I just kind of wanted to run through just a little bit about what a typical year would um, start like. So in a typical year, you would see Afton High School organized by department when you look at the physical layout of the building. Um, you would see students in classes that ranged all over the building, so they would move from one side to another and back depending upon how their schedule fell out. And you would also see scheduling conflicts that would arise um, causing students to sometimes have to take their second or third choice because some courses couldn't always be offered in an hour that the student may or may not need that based on those. So when you think of those pieces, we flipped and looked at the opportunities that we would have in this environment to create something that we could sort of capitalize on the positives as well as to manage our risks. So basically right now we have the building organized by clusters of classrooms. So we have seven different clusters throughout the building that are organized where we have an exterior door, a bathroom access that's individualized for that cluster, and then we would have an area where in that, that particular space we would have enough rooms for at least four core courses and two elective teachers to be in in that one particular moment. So since we are deploying our instruction um, asynchronously, the scheduling conflicts are virtually eliminated. So it doesn't matter if uh, a student has something offered in first hour or second hour, we just have to offer them the seven courses in this way. And that allows them to access all of their first choices for their courses. So if we come back in learning, what we will see is a kind of a three-tiered response into how we would bridge into um, returning to a somewhat normal school year. We would start with students assigned to a particular cohort within one of those clusters. They would have a teacher in the front of the classroom that would serve more as a tutor for those students because the, the instruction would actually still be being deployed asynchronously. Once that was done successfully, we would move to having teachers rotate within that same cluster of classrooms so that teachers would, um, so students would then have the opportunity to have all six of those teachers throughout some portion of the day to give them more direct tutoring and a little bit less of the asynchronous is what we were leaning on. And then again, if hopefully we would get to a position that we could have the students traveling between the classrooms, but of course that's all dependent on um, the disease and how it's passing at that moment in time. One thing that I think it's important to know is that we have three centers that are located around the building that are virtual learning centers. They provide support for students who are in the virtual learning no matter what is going on in our building. So if we bring kids back, I still have three centers that can support kids who have chosen the virtual learning option. They simply have to get a hold of me. We put them in charge with a tutor or in connection with a tutor who helps support them and then gets them moving forward with whatever their issue might be. Um, those are available every day, all day long, except for when we have the advisory happening. So when you look at what is happening in the lower levels with a virtual academy, our schedule doesn't work out quite the same. It, it creates some differences in our challenges in that I don't have an entire teacher that would have been able to serve those who chose virtual. So for almost all of my teachers, there's a section or a course that they teach that is virtual students and the rest of their day would be students that had chosen to be in person. So that's why that, that asynchronous instruction is still very important because at the high school level, it would just still be a blend um, just because the specialization of how each teacher teaches one content or one particular course strand. Um, so in essence, at the high school, what we're looking at is once we come back into the building, it's very controlled movement. 
It's within small clusters where I can isolate those clusters immediately if we were to have something happen and that that would gradually be released to get closer and closer to a more uh, normal experience for lack of a better word for the students. Um, but basically um, we're looking at trying to reach the kids asynchronously with as much support as we can possibly give them in person throughout the year. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Buck, you wanna go next and uh, talk to a little bit about the middle school. Sure, thank you. So similar to the high school in a typical year, our schedule would have a lot of students moving throughout the building, kind of transitioning from class to class. Uh, what, what is different for our schedule is that rather than having our teachers organized by content area, they're organized more by grade level. So within each grade level, we have uh, eight content area teachers, and we typically split those into two four-person teams. Each four-person team in a grade level would have a teacher from each core area, math, science, social studies, and ELA. Uh, and so those approximately 100 students would work with those specific four core teachers, kind of to create that smaller learning community. Uh, in addition to that, we would have our elective and our PE and health teachers that would kind of work with all across all grade levels and kind of rotate through those grade levels uh, over the course of a day and a week. Uh, so with a typical cohort of students at approximately 200, that means that each of our core area teachers uh, has approximately 25 at a time or 25 that would be kind of like their home group of kids. Uh, so this year, as we work through uh, parents learning option choices, trying to accommodate uh, the difference between uh, in-person and virtual academy, our goal is to as much as possible to still try to create those two grade level teams. Uh, what we found is that uh, in eighth grade that worked out well, the numbers were almost exactly half and half. So we we're able to create what were what is a virtual academy team of four different core area teachers and an in-person learning team with uh, another four core area teachers. Uh, at the sixth and seventh grade levels, those numbers were imbalanced enough that we had to kind of offset the teams also. So rather than uh, having equal numbers of teachers on each team, we had to imbalance those teams. And that required uh, quite a bit of, uh, I guess, manipulation of puzzle pieces finding different certifications that teachers had and finding the spots we could kind of plug them in uh, to work with students. So th the benefit is we still have uh, teams at each grade level, one virtual and one in person. We still have those smaller learning communities and our core area teachers still have approximately 25 or so students that are their kind of homeroom assigned students. Um, obviously, the, again, the difference is that those teams are a little offset. With our electives and our PE and health teachers, we kind of shifted away from working across all grade levels. And so now they're working with just one grade level at a time. So our elective teachers, uh, uh, for example, our art and facts will rotate from one grade level to the next, or one of the rotations is to work with all of the students in the virtual academy also. Uh, and same with PE and health, each of our three PE and health teachers is assigned to one grade level for uh, all of their instruction in both PE and health. Uh, you know, a big part uh, of the schedule relied on having those numbers balance and the certifications work out. So any shift in uh, the numbers of students in in-person versus virtual academy uh, could, uh, could cause us to kind of have to rework a lot of those, uh, those staffing plans and maybe find what certifications we can use to kind of plug in and make that still work. Uh, similar to the high school, uh, returning to in-person, we're looking at a phased approach. So we're also, we have organized the building into three clusters, which essentially looks at, uh, looks like one cluster for each grade level with their own entrance, their own restroom facilities, and their in-person team teachers kind of concentrated in that area of the building. So for the first phase, students would have uh, time with their homeroom teacher where their homeroom teacher would essentially support them through their, their virtual instruction day and provide whatever assistance they might need. So the lessons wouldn't look significantly different than they do now. They would just have a live person in the room that would kind of help support them through that. Uh, after a couple of weeks, if things are going well, we would move to a phase where the teachers within that team could rotate through and have that uh, personalized content related contact with the, with the students on their teams. And then eventually uh, all things allowing, we'd like to be able to get students to rotate at first just within that pod. And then uh, maybe if things allow to be able to rotate into you know, larger spaces throughout the building. So the large spaces, the, the library, the gym, the outdoor classroom, uh, the cafeteria, those are gonna be important in terms of being able to get students out of that individual classroom and out of those small pods for, for different uh, lessons and things like that in their small group. Uh, but as a part of that, right now, we would start with a situation where students are, are in that classroom for the day and eating lunch with those teachers. All right, thank you. Dr. Powers, talk to us a little bit about Gotch. 
Yeah, so at uh, third grade, we have 10 total teachers. Uh, three teachers right now are um, designated to the virtual academy students, and seven are teaching the in-person classes. The virtual academy classroom sizes are a little bit larger than the in-person sizes. So we also have two teacher assistants working with those three virtual uh, academy teachers. The class sizes are about 26 um, in the virtual academy compared to 18 in the in-person option at third grade. At fourth grade, we also have 10 total teachers, um, but at fourth grade, we have four teachers designated to the virtual academy st students and six for the in-person option. Uh, the virtual academy class sizes at fourth grade are also a little bit larger than the in-person option. So we have two teacher assistants working with those four virtual academy uh, teachers to support them throughout the day. The class sizes um, for virtual academy at fourth grade are um, an average of 26 compared to 19 for the in-person option. And then at fifth grade, we have nine total teachers and we have three teachers teaching the virtual academy students and six teaching the in-person option. Uh, those virtual academy classes at fifth grade are also a little bit larger than the in-person number. So we have two teacher assistants also supporting those three virtual academy uh, teachers. The class sizes for virtual academy for fifth grade are an average of 27 compared to 19 for the in-person option. Uh, so that's how we've designated our six, our six of our teacher assistants are to support those virtual academy teachers at third, fourth, and fifth grade. Um, and then we have three additional TAs and they are working with um, the Title I math teacher, the Title I reading teachers, and then our ELL teachers. So the three additional TAs are supporting those interventionists. All right, thank you. Dr. Bean, you want to talk to us a little bit about Mainier? Sure, okay. So at Mainier and at the kindergarten level, we have a total of 167 students enrolled. So we've divided those students up into 11 total classrooms. Eight of those are in person with an average of 14 kids in the class, and three are virtual with 17 students average in those classrooms. At the first grade level, we have 221 total students. So we have 15 total first grade classrooms. 11 of those are in person with an average of about 13 and four are virtual with an average of 19. At the second grade level, we have a total of 185 students. So we have 10 total classes. Seven of them are in person with 16 average in a class and three are virtual with 25 as an average in those classrooms. Um, so at Mainier, we have nine teacher assistants at this time. We are using um, three of the teacher assistants to support uh, first grade. It's, it has the largest number of students enrolled. And um, so we've, we've um, given two of them to the in-person and one to the virtual, one teacher assistant supporting kindergarten and two are supporting second grade. We also have a teacher assistant supporting ELL, one with Title I math and one with Title I reading. All right, and before we go on to early childhood, I do wanna pause and since we've kind of been talking about our K through 12 um, buildings and how they've arranged things, I, I do have Katie Mears, our uh, special education director on and wanted to just give her a, a chance to, to give just a, any update that she might think is relevant just as special education connects to to those uh, grade levels K-12. Thank you so much for letting me be here. So um, I did just kind of want to give you an update on how staffing might be because we have had a lot of questions from parents on that with us. And so all students that have an IEP do have a case manager. That case manager is the one that's been completing the DLPs with you, as well as the one who will complete the annual IEPs. And that should still stay the same. The case manager that they have should stay the same no matter which mode we're in at the time. So uh, you shouldn't expect a lot of differences and we will continue to meet the needs of all the students. I, I did wanna just make sure that we said thank you very much to all the parents because you have been so supportive. And um, I really feel like the DLPs have been going well. And just like Dr. Brock said, with the start of this year, it obviously hasn't been easy for anyone, but I think that um, 
for the most part, we're really working together. We've had a lot of uh, DLPs that we've been adjusting since it has been past the two weeks. And so um, with that, we've had a lot of intervention changes. We've had some schedule changes and um, we are starting to schedule that in-person learning. And so um, we just appreciate your feedback very much and we hope that you keep it coming. All right, and then lastly, before we pause for some questions, I, I have Lauren Knoll, who's just gonna give you a little bit of uh, an update of what's currently going on at the Early Childhood Center with a few services, as well as uh, parents as teachers. Yes, thank you, Dr. Brock. So we do, um, we are implementing our daycare in-person option with our um, Afton School District and Special School District staff students. Um, currently, our facilitators for Cougar Care are assisting and supporting um, anywhere from five to eight students per cohort um, for those learning options and working with their classroom teachers virtually. Um, the learning activities that they do opposite of the days that the kids are um, virtual learning in their classrooms are fun uh, learning activities that are age appropriate for them. Uh, with parents as teachers, we're currently doing um, all virtual and um, our family visits are uh, the choice with uh, DESI approval of video conferencing or teleconferencing. Uh, those are both accepted ways to do the um, family visits at this time. Um, virtual family group connections, we have started those. We've scheduled several monthly um, virtual group connections and we have several, um, several community outreach that are working with us on that. The St. Louis County Library is one of them. Uh, West County Psychological Services is doing some um, um, different group connections with COVID for the adults and families, uh, which has been a very big topic that, that parents and families have reached out to us for. Um, virtual screening of our children has been a very interesting topic. So our parent educators, and I'm sure Katie could refer to this with special school district, but our parent educators have learned to um, work with families um, on how to implement. They have been more of a facilitator um, on working with families on the skills that they need to see for screening virtually. So uh, <laughs> I think Jordan can relate to this with his two little ones and his parent educator. They were able to successfully um, screen. Um, sometimes it takes a little longer uh, than that one visit, but it is getting done so that we're making sure that um, our children are age appropriate in their development as well. As far as our special school district staff at the Early Childhood Center, um, they are doing um, what um, Afton is doing as a partnering district, and they are virtual learning with their students and coming in and working from their classrooms, and they are also working from home. So we do have a, additional capacity um, for Afton School District and SS school, or SSD staff children. Um, that may need to utilize our daycare option if we do make the decision um, to go in-person learning. So um, our building does have room for more students if that would be the case. Um, we also have those precautions and safety measures um, in place for students to move through our building in those small cohort numbers. Uh, we can also utilize additional facilitators if that's an option as well to support the preschool age children that might be able to come in um, person learning as well. All right, thank you. Uh, the last comment I'll just make before I open it up for any questions that you might have. Um, I, I don't know whether I, I showed you the, the total of our enrollment, but at this time last year, we're really down about 40 kids from where we were this time last year. And if you looked at the kindergarten numbers, which do continue to creep up, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and so that's really where I think we've seen the biggest impact on, um, you know, students that might typically be in the district in classroom. I think it's really kindergarten is where that discrepancy, you know, is, is probably the most noticeable. So I know that's been a question I've gotten from time to time from community members is just what does the enrollment look like? Are there about the same number of students? You know, how's that trending? And like I said, we, we really are 
are only noticeably down probably in, in what we would anticipate with our kindergarten cohort. So overall from this time last year, um, about 40 students less than, than we were at uh, a year ago. So with that, any, any questions that, that you might have or anything you're, you're curious about or comments just on how we're trying to organize our staff would be, be good. I've got a question. I was trying to let somebody else go first, but I will jump in here. Um, it was the first time I've been, I've heard uh, a lot of the hard work that's been going into the high school and the middle school in putting together some planning. So I, I appreciate all that effort. It sounds like there's been a lot of thought and a lot of uh, hard work put together there. Um, I'm curious, and are we, um, are we tracking similar sized buildings that have hybrid opened and fully opened around the region to find out about their experiences and maybe in, maybe iterate on the, the work we've done? Um, what is there, what's the thought there? Because we do have a lot of examples across the board um, between the various counties around us and Illinois. So I meet regularly with a group of principals that are uh, both regionally and actually across the uh, country from people that I've met over the years, uh, where we do compare and talk about what's going on in each of their settings. Uh, we talk about the plans that we have put together and how um, you know, each of them are, are fairly similar, but yet they also have some very significant differences as well. And so we're able to kind of learn from each other as far as what works, what doesn't, what's, what's happening and what's not. So we're staying in communication on a regular basis to try to make sure I can make those adjustments ahead of time instead of waiting for us to learn from what happens at Afton, but also learning from our partner districts surrounding us. Good. So some of those buildings are open that you're that you're meeting with and getting feedback from. That's that's uh, great. I'm similar similarly connected with uh, a number of middle school administrators from the immediate area, but then a broader area where some of them are open. Good. Thank you. I, I would say, Mike, the one thing I would add. I just um, uh, spoke with um, Dr. Powers and and Dr. Bean today for about thirty minutes. They reached out to. Uh, an elementary principal in Lindbergh, uh, just to see what experiences they've had. Uh, they have K through five um, that they've they've been uh, having some experience with. So, the, definitely, we're trying to learn as much as we can from uh, from any anyone that has maybe had a, an experience that's a little bit different than ours. And so, uh, that will certainly continue um, to you know whatever whatever decisions we make, we'll try to try to draw upon what what other folks feel like they've done well and where where they maybe not had uh, certain successes. Anything else? Can we talk a little bit about attendance, how we know kids are showing up and engaging? I'll, I'll maybe- Right now we're missing kids. Are we losing kids? Yeah, I'll maybe, maybe real quick, uh, maybe we'll start at Manier and then kind of run up through the high school. What are some of the things you're doing to try to, to, to keep a handle on, on uh, that attendance uh, item. Sure, at Manier, our teachers are taking attendance at that morning class meeting. Um, and then for any students that aren't at that meeting, they're checking in with families to see um, what the barrier to learning is. We also have our teachers completing an engagement um, survey each week to let us know which students they're concerned about their engagement so that um, the principals and counselors can help um, come up with a plan to support those families. So we're meeting weekly to talk about the kiddos that um, we have engagement concerns about and finding solutions. Is that a, a large number, small number, medium? What does that look yeah. like? So um, for the past, over the past two weeks, we have a total of 12 kids that have been um, referred to the, our administrative team to figure out a solution for. So I think that's really relatively small, 12 out of 571. So, yeah. At Gotch, um, it's very similar to, to Manier. So classroom teachers are monitoring student attendance in their Google Meets. 
and then also monitoring the work that kids are turning in. Um, if there are concerns and they're reaching out to those individual families. We also have a uh, student engagement survey that teachers fill out if they have reached out to families and they're still having concerns with kids either connecting through the Google Meets or completing assignments or they're just not seeing them on a regular basis. And then the counselors and the principals are uh, following up with those families to try and see what other supports that we can put in place. Our number's a little bit higher than main years, so we have about, um, since the start of, start of school, we have about 50 entries into that survey, but there are some students that have um, been entered more than once, so multiple teachers may be entering that same student, so between 45 and 50 students um, that we've been following up on with concerns about attendance. Very similar to both Mainer and Gotch, uh, teachers complete uh, spreadsheet on student engagement. Uh, and then when we meet with uh, each team of teachers, we kind of talk through uh, what those uh, concerns look like. And so we're seeing, you know, a little bit of a uh, back and forth. So maybe we're seeing a student not engaging in the Google Meets, but submitting assignments, uh, or maybe some other students uh, that are just the opposite and are, are coming to the Google Meets, but then not submitting assignments. Uh, and so uh, teachers are, are reaching out to those and working through you know, how do we how do we get those kids back back to engage? We've had done some home visits uh, to try and get students a little more engaged and started uh, just a little bit uh, today and really head into a big tomorrow with bringing students into the building uh, that are engagement concerns. So similar to Gotch, we're probably in that uh, 45 to 50 range. So maybe four or five students uh, for each grade level team that uh, that we're really working towards trying to get a little higher engagement for. So at Afton High School, um, it's a little bit different because we have kids who will definitely engage in classes that they really enjoy and not necessarily all seven of those. So we have it broken down just a little bit differently, but we're following the same, uh, same process as you're hearing in the other buildings. So um, the biggest catch for us initially is the advisory teacher. The advisory teacher sees the students first thing in the morning and right before we release them for the day. And so if someone hasn't checked in in one of those two, there's a reference that's given to the counselors to just kind of keep an eye on what's going on. So it's not necessarily a phone call immediately, but it is if there's a, a day or two that run together. Um, we are also cross-referencing that with the students' work. Uh, those teachers are letting all of us know if there's anything that we need to be concerned about, whether that's an, uh, an attendance in one hour or not. The second tier of, of keeping track of attendance is the actual classroom teacher who's also reaching out home to let people know if they're not doing anything and then referring that again to the uh, middle or to the assistant principals and counselors who are then doing interventions. Like the middle school, we do have a few students who have started to come in um, on an, and by appointment only basis if they are not engaging and we cannot get them going and basically we're bringing them in, helping them get organized and then sending them on their way and keeping an eye on them. Now they have one person that's assigned to them to ensure that they stay engaged. Um, our numbers too are probably a little bit higher than that. All right, anything else before we kind of move on to the, to the next section? All right, well, in the next section, myself and uh, Sarah Springer are going to talk just a little bit about some of the things that we're keeping an eye on. Certainly when you, you talk about, um, I guess, uh, keeping up with uh, just uh, all kinds of data and information that's out there, you can certainly look at things on a state level, a county level, a zip code level, and, and more, more than ever, what we've been hearing, um, you know, uh, uh, here locally is just can we look at things, you know, by age group? Uh, specifically when we're talking about students, are there things we can get that are kind of segmented that way? So not really sure that I would say we've got a perfect way to look at everything, but I did want to at least just let you in on in, in everything that's out there to look at. Um, what are some of the things that we're trying to hone in on? And then what are, you know, what are some of the things that we'll continue to monitor, knowing that certainly this is not, not an exhaustive list of everything that, that can be looked at. And I don't know that there's any one thing you look at that gives you the, the magic answer. Uh, so you really do have to be aware of a number of things. So we'll kind of transition to, to looking at some of that information now. Um, so the three big sources that, that I've been looking at or, or trying to draw upon are, are certainly the, the site that the State um, uh, Department of Health runs, the Senior Services, uh, St. Louis County um, has, has their 
uh, statistics and then uh, the, the website that's uh, a gentleman from SLU maintains. Those are, uh, in general, some of the primary things that, that I try to look at and, and be aware of. And one of the things that has, I've looked at to try to help me narrow in of all these things we could look at, what are some things that maybe folks are saying you should hone in on, and, and certainly a lot of these items, they're, they're suggesting you should look at some of the most recent information. So the, the seven day rolling average or 14 day rolling average, whenever you think about some of these items. So that's also something we've tried to hone in on. And so one of the things I wanna show you is just um, ways that people are looking at the new cases. So certainly you can look at a cumulative total, but then how are you trying to look at some of the items that have happened over the last seven days or the last rolling average. And once again, not that there's a, a perfect science to this. When you talk about things like a lot of people refer to it as gating criteria or what are some, some uh, cut points that you're looking at to decide when maybe you should be completely remote versus when should you consider in-person learning. Um, these are some of the things that have been referenced. And, and in other states, you know, Missouri is not taking uh, an approach statewide, but in, in some areas they are taking a, a similar approach. And once again, there are some nuances to this. So I wanted to just kind of reference at least one item that folks are looking at, which is as you're looking at that um, daily new case count, you can kind of see where Afton has been and, and where we're headed. Um, and that's the purple line. And then you can also, also see the state and the county in red and blue. So our particular zip code, which, you know, once again, that doesn't tell you the whole story because um, although our kids, for the most part, reside here in 63123, we certainly know we have staff members and folks that, that live elsewhere. So it does give you a little bit of perspective of how we're faring in St. Louis County and Afton um, compared to the state. And it kind of gives you an idea, are things trending? What, what direction are things trending in? I, you know, based upon that, uh, that Harvard information based upon some of the gating criteria that some states are using, you know, they would say above 25. Um, that's when you should really be remote um, for, for all of your learners. If you're kind of in that 10 to 25 range, you could consider some variations of in-person learning. Certainly that could be a hybrid approach. And then below 10, um, and, and certainly they, they make a distinction of age of student. So you can kind of see that middle area, there's some hesitancy to bring back your oldest students, but then in the bottom area, uh, it, it seems like there could be a consideration if you make it to that bottom area for learners of, of all ages. And like I said, there's, there's no specific uh, thing that you can point to to make the decision, but it's at least a, 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 a something to, to guide your decision making. And then uh, in, in St. Louis, more and more we are getting some data segmented by um, age of students. So this is one example. I believe this comes from the St. Louis County um, two-week trend report that's put out. And so they are trying to give us uh, some data that is segmented by age of students. And so you can certainly see that some of our older students, ages 15 through 19, um, it kind of stands out that that, that uh, uh, trend is looking a little bit different than students that are, are say, younger than, than 14. Um, one other item besides new cases is just positivity rate. Um, so I wanted to just show you what that looks like. And, and this is something that I referenced uh, back in July. So if you can remember a lifetime ago, back to July 25th, whenever we were talking about, um, you know, what are some of our options on how to start school, this type of information was just emerging. Like I said, in some states like New York and Nebraska, this was something that was um, applied or was suggested should be applied that districts look at it. You know, Missouri hasn't taken that approach, but we can still look at some of the things they set up as their gating criteria. And certainly when we were talking about this July 25th, um, the, the positivity rate in St. Louis County was definitely trending towards that nine or 10% and above. And in a lot of, um, a lot of uh, states that would have, have triggered a remote start or that would have triggered uh, that line of thinking. So when we kind of take a look at where has Missouri been and where has St. Louis County been, um, you know, over the, the past few weeks, you can see that, you know, just like we talked about in July, even in August, um, you know, the, 
the, the rate was, was still um, fairly at, at a threshold where you, you might consider remote learning as, as the best option. But you can see there certainly is some progress uh, that is being made over the last uh, two weeks or so. So wanted to, to kind of show you where that looks like as far as positivity. And then once again, we are little by little getting more age group data um, to look at in regards to segmenting uh, the positivity data. And once again, you can kind of see that 15 through 19 group sticks out as being a, a bit higher than some of the other uh, age group when you look at positivity. Transmission rate is something that you look at. So uh, certainly you hope that if, if someone has COVID, they don't transmit it to anyone, but that is some, something that you, you also want to have a barometer on is how likely is it that a person that becomes positive is going to possibly infect someone else. And so, you know, uh, a, a positivity rate of one means that you're likely to transmit it to one other person. And you can certainly see that uh, in St. Louis County, this blue line, it was uh, what most would consider rather high as far as that transmission rate around 1.6. And you can kind of see that St. Louis County and, and really the state of Missouri have kind of leveled off right there at one. And so that's kind of the best way to explain transmission rate is if it's at a one, you're likely to transmit it to one other person. Um, obviously, the lower that number is, uh, the better. That's, that's what you're going for is, is no transmission. And uh, one, of the, one of the last ones I want to draw your attention to is uh, hospitalization. Uh, this is one that we really haven't gotten a lot of good age group data on that, that I can put my hands on. So we really are just kind of looking at new hospitalizations over, um, you know, over time. And so you, you can see that there certainly was, um, you know, a dip there in, um, you know, in June. And then it, it's, we've kind of just stayed in about the same place with, uh, with new hospitalizations on a daily basis. And like I said, um, it, it's, it's been a little bit of a struggle, uh, unlike positivity rate and, um, and uh, new cases, it's been hard to, to, to get our, our hands on some, some age group data around hospitalization. And then lastly, not, uh, certainly not something you like to talk about, but as you look at different indicators that um, some of the studies say you do need to keep an eye on, um, this is another indicator that they, they talk about, you know, needing to monitor. And so St. Louis County website um, has this graph that they keep up with each day, which talks about um, the, the deaths uh, uh, each day throughout the county. And then lastly, um, the state of this, this data comes from the state of Missouri. So as the state of Missouri, um, you know, keeps count, they do have it segmented by um, some of these age groups. And so you can kind of see what that, what that information looks like. So with that, um, that certainly isn't an exhaustive list, but those are some things that, uh, that we've put together just for you to consider. And then I do want to uh, turn it over to Sarah Springer to talk just a little bit about the uh, inter or the dashboard that we're creating. So as we get school started, as we want to, you know, make sure that we're keeping up with our staff and our students, um, what would that look like if we were kind of trying to keep a pulse on what's the current status of our of the staff and students in our district? So I'll have her explain a little bit about not only what our current data looks like, but then what is this process that we're going to deploy to to keep up with this progressively throughout the school year. Hi, so yeah, I'll talk to you guys a little bit more about the Afton COVID dashboard. Dr. Brock, if you wanna switch sides over to, to show the dashboard. Um, so as you can see on the dashboard, um, it will show positive tests and it will show that by building. And then you'll also see current quarantine staff by building and then current quarantine students. And then there is a district total at the end. Uh, so first I wanna thank Erica Chandler for helping us put this in place. Um, this will be displayed on our website um, under the COVID tab is where we'll store this. Um, the COVID dashboard will be updated every Monday in real time, um, and it will not display a running total. Um, so it will show numbers of that week. Um, and so as you can imagine, these numbers have already changed from what was displayed um, on the PowerPoint slide. And so um, 
we currently have one student that we are aware of that's quarantined at the high school and then for current numbers as of today we do have an employee uh, that is quarantined as well at the early childhood center um, so human resources will continue to track employee related COVID data, um, including a running total. So it won't be displayed on the dashboard, but internally we will be tracking that information. Um, the nurses across the Afton School District will be provided tracking instructions and data processes by Ellen Silo, the district nurse coordinator, and they'll, uh, they plan on keeping a running total as well. Um, so, uh, the, uh, quarantine, as defined by the CDC, is used to keep someone who might have been exposed to COVID-19 away from others. And so that's the definition that we're really using when looking at this dashboard. And so um, quarantine helps prevent the spread of the disease that can occur before a person knows they are sick or if they are infected with the virus without feeling symptoms. So people in quarantine should stay home, separate themselves from others, monitor their health, and follow directions from their state or local health department. And so that's really uh, the purpose of putting this in place, is to kind of show how many people we're trying to um, keep out of the workplace or out of school to prevent um, possible exposures. Um, and so human resources will include staff within the quarantine numbers for the following reasons. Um, if they're considered a close contact with a positive case, so within six feet for 15 minutes um, at work or outside of the workplace to someone who is symptomatic. Um, all reasons listed in the emergency paid sick leave pursuant to the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And so some of those reasons are the employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine related to COVID. The employee is subject to federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation related to COVID. Uh, the employee is experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and is seeking a medical diagnosis. The employee is caring for an individual subject to federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID. And the employee is experiencing any other substantially similar condition specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And the other reason, the last reason for staff will be waiting on COVID-19 test results. So that could be the employee themselves waiting for test results or someone within their household or someone they care for. The student numbers, the student quarantine numbers will reflect a student who is considered a close contact to a positive case within 16 feet for 15 minutes at school or outside of school uh, to somebody who is symptomatic, um, a student who has advised by a healthcare provider um, to self-quarantine related to COVID, um, who's been, sorry, advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine, a student who is subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID, and then also uh, waiting for COVID test results. So if the student themselves is waiting for test results or if somebody within their household is waiting for test results. And so the quarantine numbers for both staff and students will not, again, not include those positive case isolations because they'll be reflected within those uh, positive test uh, numbers. So that's really, it's a lot of information um, that Ellen Silo, our district nurse coordinator, uh, will be in charge of um, kind of tracking all the student information. And then um, I plan to track all of the staffing information. So we'll have more internal numbers, but we just are deciding to display this information on the dashboard. All right, so I'll go ahead and pause there and just, you know, questions, comments that folks that have folks kind of related to that. So, let's see, Michelle? Um, I have not spoken on the meeting yet, I just realized. Can you guys hear me? Oh, good, okay. <laughs> um, I just, I wanna say that I just think the dashboard is fantastic and thank you so much for doing that. I, I just listened to a whole news report today about how families across the country are struggling so much to get districts to give them transparent information about numbers. Um, and HIPAA is really kind of can be confusing and people hide behind it to keep information. And so uh, this is a ton of work 
And there are not very many organizations putting together dashboards like that. And I think as a school board, that's very forward thinking. So thank you very much for doing that. I appreciate it. Yeah, Mike. Yeah. You knew you weren't going to get by on the statistics without me asking a question, right? Um, so on the uh, the positivity rate, um, are they are the numbers that are being put out there? Are they normalizing those numbers at all for the changes in tests, or do you know uh, on the numbers that you're looking at whether they are uh, taking into consideration some of the the variations in that? data set yeah I, I don't know that i would be able to tell you i'd have to look at um, you know any any um information that is fed into that one graph that you're talking about it's um sort of a cross between looking at the st louis county website and the uh slu website that that gentleman maintains so um as you might expect oddly enough sometimes i have to look at both of those to get mm -hmm. you know to get the number I want. Uh, no one spot has uh, exactly what you need, and then you have to you have to kind of look at both places. So yeah, I'd, I'd have to look and see if they have any disclaimers there about you know how, how exactly they're updating things as maybe things get updated a couple days later. I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah, I just didn't know about there's there's some there's some normalization of the numbers based on some of the different parameters, and I. It looked like the numbers you were using were were normalized, but I don't I don't I just was asking. Um, I, there's a, there's a lot of numbers out there, and there's a lot of conjecture out there. So, anything else before we kind of move on to our last segment? All right, then I'll, I'll kind of move on to our last segment and, and really just to kind of, you know, as we, we uh, go into the slides here, you know, there's really a lot of things that are kind of playing into what, what exactly is maybe different now than uh, where we were in July. And, and I do think that even though there's not one specific indicator that you're looking at, one of the, the things I wanted to draw your attention to is it just seems like there is a little bit more conclusive information that is coming out about um, now that schools have started in certain areas, you know, how can we hone in on, um, you know, some, some segmented data for our students? And so is, is there a way to try to be responsive to that? And, and what are the right ways to be responsive to that? So that's really, to me, a big difference than where we were in July. While, while we all certainly, I think, knew that there could be differences in how um, students respond to, to COVID-19, I just think there's a lot of unknown out there of just what, you know, even though maybe there's studies from other countries that have reopened schools, you know, how is that really going to, to play out? And so I think we, you know, uh, we're certainly still learning every day, but I do feel like we've got just a little bit more knowledge. Well, I think we've got a lot more knowledge now than we did, you know, back in July at this time. So that, that's really kind of the crux of what, uh, what I think going forward we kind of need to need to consider and figure out what some of the, the right things to do uh, will be. And so that kind of leads into uh, recommendations going forward. And so a couple other things that's maybe uh, connected to the data, but also just a little bit separate. Um, we, we certainly uh, have, have gotten some feedback from our local pediatricians. They had been, you know, co communicating with all school districts really throughout this whole process. So I give a lot of credit to a number of pediatricians that are, are giving their time and expertise to districts, you know, that they don't have to do that, but they're trying to help out in any way that they can. And, and certainly there was a, a thought that uh, possibly it, it would be uh, for our younger students beneficial if, if in-person is possible to allow that to happen. And so they, they did put a letter together that's been circulated to schools and, and in general, it just says, you know, they, they think that specifically now here in the St. Louis area, it's time to consider that. So if you have put that off your radar, uh, they'd like to suggest that you put that back on your radar for consideration. Uh, we also were issued a letter from the St. Louis Public Health Department um, that in essence kind of says the same thing, is that uh, for our youngest learners, um, elementary students, if you had kind of put an in-person learning off your radar, 
uh, they think that the conditions uh, could be in place to consider that. Not telling you that you have to do that, not telling you that you must do that on any particular timeline, but that discussion should, uh, you know, should be opened up uh, for consideration. And then lastly, um, you know, talking a little bit about sports, we also have gotten some guidelines, um, you know, about youth sports. And it looks like there's much more comfort when uh, kids are under 14 in regards to those guidelines versus um, 14 and older. And then as we mentioned, there's some indicators that we just reviewed that do seem like when, you know, for 14 and older, some of the, uh, some of the, the statistics look uh, a little bit different for, for that age range. So going forward, um, some things that I think we're, need to, we're gonna need to consider and talk about as a district is just, and unless things start looking a little bit differently for you know, our students 14 and older, um, I, I think uh, right now I, I haven't heard of, uh, of any districts in the area that really feel like bringing a lot of those students back for in-person learning is, is, uh, is on their radar to do. Nevertheless, we'll, that doesn't mean that we can't still making progress on how we're serving students at that age level. So that's one consideration that seems to be um, necessary for us to think about going forward. And then certainly um, one of the things that I think a lot of districts are considering are uh, grades K through eight and, and just what options, what windows do we have into possibly reconsidering um, certain decisions. And so I think that's really what, what I would like to convey as well as I think it, it would be prudent for the district to think about those things. Um, uh, our quarter ends on October 23rd. So that's over a month away. And so certainly we, we could just wait till the end of, of first quarter and then officially reevaluate. At the same time, I do think um, it looks like it's worthy of a, of a, a discussion right now which is, is, is there anything we can do prior to that? And I think those, that was a big reason why we wanted to launch the thought exchange. Um, and, and so that's, that's one reason why we really wanna to try to ramp up this week, that discussion of how do people feel about that? What's, what's, when's too soon? When's too long? When is just right for some of these things to possibly happen? I do think conclusively around the area, um, you're seeing people, if they are bringing um, kids back in person, it's, the, it's their younger students, it's through a hybrid model, and so that's likely going to be, you know, a, a vast part of the discussion is how do we do that safely? So how do we control the number of kids in a classroom um, as well as the entire school at any one time? And then lastly, at the Early Childhood Center, um, you know, I, I think that um, you, you never know, given the conditions you have, knowing the conditions that might change. We certainly, you know, made, made a, a decision to try to support our K through five grades. Um, I, I don't think, um, I don't think you could go wrong with, with continuing to support uh, uh, using those staff members. And so I, I guess that's a lot of the uncertainty that goes into this school year is once you make a big decision like that, um, you know, how can you continue to try to make that work for as many families and kids as possible? Um, so I, I do think that there certainly are some considerations on what we need to do going forward at the Early Childhood Center. Um, and uh, at the same time, I, I, I feel like those staff members are serving in some very positive roles, um, you know, where they're currently uh, deployed. And so I, I certainly think there's a lot of benefit that's being gained from, uh, from that decision as well. So ultimately, one of the things that I'd happy to, uh, to hear from uh, all of our board members on. Um, I, I feel like as much as we definitely started our school year off correctly and the, the way we went about making the decision, I think was absolutely right on the mark. We gave people a month uh, notice on how we plan to start school. I think that helped out a lot. I think it was uh, very appropriate for, for the board to have a big role in that. Um, we also did a lot of input gathering the week leading up to our meeting on July 25th. So I feel like we went about the process the right way. That being said, I, I just simply don't see this school year playing out where we can always time decisions um, perfectly with a board meeting. And, and as the data is suggesting, as it looks like we are getting into this school year, I'm, I'm not sure we're gonna have the ability to sort of take this one size fits all we're making a decision, you know, 
pre-K through 12. I, I really think we are in a position where we're going to have to start making specific decisions uh, by building, by grade level, um, given you know, what, what is at our disposal. And so that also, I think, makes it difficult to continue to have to come back um, for a board meeting or um, I, I just think it, it's going to be prudent to continue to keep our board in the conversation as well as our staff and our parents and our students. So I don't think we need to be making any decisions in isolation. Um, at the same time, I do think we need to give ourselves the ability to get groups of folks together. So staff members, um, listen to parents, and then you know try to make those decisions as quick as possible while still um, implementing a lot of safety, a lot of precaution. And I feel like we've done that um, the whole way, uh, the whole way along. So I, I hope everyone would concur that we've not rushed into any decision. We've not done risky things just because we think that we need to. I think we've taken a lot of time and put a lot of thought into erring on the side of caution. And I think that will continue. I just also think that we, we're going to have to start making decisions at these uh, points that don't perfectly align with a board meeting and they don't perfectly align with a quarter where we're going to have to give ourselves the flexibility to think about those things a little bit differently. And, um, and that's, that's really what, uh, what I'm kind of curious about your thoughts on some of those ideas, recommendations. And certainly um, the other thing I would like to add is that um, tomorrow, we do have a meeting with our task force members. So we've got an elementary task force, uh, uh, a secondary task force. Those meetings are scheduled. Um, I wanna update them on uh, some of the things that you've seen tonight, but then also get their thoughts on some of these ideas. And, and that's made up of our staff members, support staff, as well as certified. And then we also have parents on that. So just like our thought exchange is trying to give us some insight into what the next correct decisions are for the district that was deployed to staff and students and parents. We also want to uh, begin engaging our task force, which um, was a, a part of that decision making, you know, in, uh, leading up to July 25th as well. So definitely want folks to know that as much as I think we're going to need to give ourselves the ability to make decisions, maybe a little bit more timely than we have, we also want to be inclusive um, you know, throughout, throughout the process. So that's really what, what I wanted to, to, to present and then happy to answer further questions or, or get feedback from you. Well, first I just wanna say thank you for a really comprehensive workshop to provide this information. And also um, Dr. Brock, I know you've spent quite a bit of time with us as individuals and collectively to talk about this um, at these board meetings. Uh, so, if there are some questions or comments, I think Mike had his hand raised. Mike? Yeah, so um, this is this has all been good. I, I agree with what Patricia said. This is There's a lot of communication going on here, um, and that is a healthy thing. Question, um, when you start looking at the possibility of bringing some of the younger kiddos back, there's obviously a lag in preparation. I'm not looking for a date. I'm not looking for that. But how 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 much time once a decision is made do we need to actually execute? What does that window look like? How prepared are we to to just to go? Is it three days? Is it ten days? Is it what is it? What, what do you think it is? Yeah. I, I would say initially, given that we didn't start the year with any in person learning just for getting communication out to parents and then doing, I guess, what I would call a proper amount of training with teachers and just making sure that anyone that's going to have to switch to in-person, um, my thought was two weeks. Um, and so that's why I really, I, I feel like this is a very key week. Um, I, I feel like we need to, to gather as much information as possible um, so that if we can put a date out there, um, you know, we can get to that decision as quick as possible. So um, I think later on in the school year, if we need to switch from different modes because of certain conditions we're seeing, we'll be able to possibly do that quicker. But the initial, I guess you would say switch, um, that would be my best estimate is, um, is two weeks. But I'm also happy to hear um, from anyone else that 
it, whether they think that's too soon, too long. Um, that's just my, my thoughts. Yeah, and just to clarify, I don't think you intended it either. I'm not saying two weeks from today for anybody. Yeah, yeah. so uh, whenever. Delta of whenever we decide how long does it take to execute, so. It, exactly, so thanks for clarifying that is, is I, I, we definitely don't intend to make that decision right now or, or tonight, but when that is public, when you know our parents are notified, I would kind of view we're probably setting that return two weeks from when we officially make sure that everybody has been notified of that of that change. Um, so that that would be my best estimate right now. Right. And I would also add, while I'm just speaking here, that I completely agree that administration needs to make the moves when the moves need to be made, and um, we don't need to be standing in the way uh, formally in in that sense to uh, to what's best for the kids. Michelle? Um, I just, I guess just a brief question. It sounds to me like when we heard from different principals, um, like there, and even from Katie, there is a good bit of flexibility at this point for um, a bit of coming and going with kids who either need it because of interventions that are needed, or for instance, I have a kid who needs to go to the high school to learn how to use a piece of equipment on Friday. I just got an email today. Do you think, I mean, are we just gonna see some increase in that as well while we kind of wait for bigger decisions to be made, do you think? Yeah, that, that's a good point, Michelle. I'm glad you brought that up. So, um, you know, just like our special education department, teachers have been working on how, how can they operationalize some in-person service for some very specific needs. Our principals have been working on kind of that, that same idea or concept for you know, specific purposes. And so, yes, I, you know, in, until, you know, until we have a definitive decision and, and that's been announced, uh, we will continue to proceed with trying to bring small groups of students in for some very specific purposes. So, yeah, I, I would, I would con continue to see that moving along and little by little each week, probably finding more opportunities, different opportunities for, for some of those specific in-person things to happen. Are there questions, comments, thoughts from the board members? I know we've been doing this for three hours now. We're kind of brain dead, right? Not exactly. We're still here. I'm looking at everyone, just trying to make sure you have the opportunity. All right. All right. Well, Really, the last thing I would say to just to wrap up, and I won't I won't pull the slides back up, but I will just reiterate um, what what are some of the things that lead me to you know put out I guess that two week um, time frame. You also have to understand we really have not started up a lot of our key operations that will have to be activated a little bit differently for in person service. So we will have to work with our food service department to make sure that we're ready to operationalize that if kids are going to be in the building um, we will have to to revisit transportation and we really don't have a lot of students that live beyond three and a half miles so when you're looking at um, just our k through eight buildings it's really about 30 students um, and so if you add um, high school in there it gets up to about 40 so um, transportation is one of those where uh, so far haven't found anybody that has a lot of good solutions they say it's it's tricky any, any way you go uh, I think conclusively we don't see a lot of districts um, you know if they can keep from putting a lot of kids on the bus at one time that seems to be the approach is is just to uh, uh, kind of what you're doing in the classrooms of keeping desks apart um, you know that's the approach on the bus too. So it really does make transportation very tough to, to figure out. You certainly want to do what you can, but um, it is hard to, you know, to, to foresee a lot of transportation happening. And then certainly, I think it goes without saying, you've heard a lot of this. We are still definitely envisioning all of the safety precautions that we talked about in the reopening document with just um, a, a number of things from wearing masks, uh, students and staff from, you know, keeping up with cleaning, from, you know, keeping 
a very safe amount of kids in each classroom, a very safe amount of kids in, in a building, like all of those things hopefully still go without saying in regards to we want all of that to continue to be part of our plan, even though we haven't really had to operationalize some of those things, we still envision that being key. But like I said, since we really haven't done a lot of in-person service, I, wanted, I just wanna make sure that any decision we make, we've got plenty of time to do training with nurses, with staff members, and that you know it is about confidence. So right now we're gaining a lot of confidence with uh, doing online learning, little by little, day by day. Um, it's gonna take the same thing with anything we do in person. There's gonna have to just little by little be a lot of confidence that starts to build. I think that's happening. We've got a lot of staff members that are coming into work. So they're working from their classroom. So I do think that we've got that confidence that's building, but certainly um, you know, when, when we uh, want to reintroduce students into that equation, then there's just going to have to kind of be that next level of planning that we'll, we'll also have to be confident of. So that's really you know, what I would add to this is just some of those operations that once we have that under our belt, later on in the school year, Unfortunately, if we do have to switch back to remote learning, but then maybe we do see a window open up to go back in person, I think that switch might be able to happen a little bit quicker, maybe, um, you know, maybe later in the year, because we'll already have a lot of this experience under our belt. Okay, thank you. The next item on the agenda is um, board comments and I'm going to ask that we forego board comments unless there's something very specific that you would like to say this evening. Uh, but I would, again, on behalf of the entire board, thank all of the administrators who are present tonight for the presentation, for all of the great work you're doing, and to thank our teachers and our staff throughout the district who are taking care of our students and just making the best of what we have going on. And there are really good things going on in our district. So thank you all so much. And for all of the people who have hung in with us tonight, we had 40 something people who were on the meeting in addition to our panelists. So we're pretty popular. That was kind of exciting and lots of them stayed. And again, as always, thank you for my fellow board members for your volunteer service to our Afton School District and our community. So if there's a board member that has something else to say, you're, you get your chance now. Jordan. I'll make it brief even for myself. Um, no, it was a special shout out to our uh, buildings and grounds maintenance and custodial staff who have been in the buildings and with our teachers and they are truly, uh, that's the unsung heroes right now that are keeping things clean and, and well uh, maintained and working with the teachers in the building. So phenomenal, phenomenal work. And I thank you personally. Okay. Anyone else? I'm going to scan, put your hand up. I think we're good. All right. Thank you all. Have a great evening. And I call this meeting adjourned. <laughs>